Hey everyone, welcome back. Hi. It's Friday afternoon, and this is what kind of internet do you want? News show, I guess, is now what we're calling it. Yeah, I feel like it needs a name, but I don't know. News show works. We've been referring it to it to it as live show, but of course, we haven't done it live yet. Uh, we'll do a few of these pre-recorded to live, and then eventually make them live. But really, the subject is the news, so I think we'll call it the news show, the Web three weekly news, or what kind of internet do you want? Weekly news. I don't podcast. know. Podcast. If you have any thoughts, please uh, share them in the podcast. comments. What I think it the be? whole thing Suppose. is what kind of internet do you want? Podcast. But yeah. we'll have yeah. to put up a poll. All right. Well, let's dive Fourth in to... Oh, yeah. Happy 4th. Independence Day. Yeah. That's what we're all here for. Yay. Independence. <laughs> Actually, that was pretty funny. Our ops manager, we were talking about whether we were going to do a tweet for the 4th of July. And he's like, I mean, isn't this whole in this whole industry supposed to be about freedom? And, you know, 4th of July is supposed to be... Isn't it supposed to be I, about independence or something like that? I think it depends on what class like you're that? in, yeah. honestly. Right? And by class, I mean, like, what year you joined the crypto movement. There's like... It's like, you know, your high school class or whatever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the class of... Like, I don't know exactly when it started because I feel like the class of like 13, oh, 9, 10 oh, is yeah. like Those more are... like uber nerd. But mm -hmm. then the class of like, Those are the I don't punks. know if it starts 12 or 13, but 13, 14, 15 is like the freedom class. Agreed. The Agreed. Low, yeah. Agreed. And then you get into 17, 17 18. 18 and you get into the money it's class. The NFT class. It's when finance got into it. It's when PR got into it. It's when just DeFi. like a lot of money got yep. into it. Yep, yep, yep. And then now, now I hope anyway, we're in that sort of new internet class. I, I, yeah, I was going to call it the consolidation class. It's like when the real stuff starts to get. I hope so. Sure feels like it's built and put yeah. together because. Yeah. The thing that we didn't realize at the time was just like how many specific components that there would be that would need to be built mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. sheer amount of work mm -hmm. involved in building those components. Well, I think I assumed there would be fewer low-level protocols with more stuff built on top of them, but there's just so much incentive to reinvent the lower level protocol. And that might be, you know, not necessarily for, for yeah, the better. For the best. It, there, no, it turns I agree. out there's a I lot agree. of things that do very, very similar things that overlap. But it's possible that they're kind of building upon each other and improving upon each other. I so. don't know. This has been on my mind a lot too, how whether the incentive structures that um, do exist or that we are working on, whether those are going to lead to the ultimate outcomes that we all hope for, right? It's sort of that like Betamax loss to VHS, even though Betamax was the better technology. And I mm -hmm. used to sort of have this mm -hmm. naivete that the better technology would just automatically win. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've been feeling a little bit down, to be perfectly honest, about the future of the web. And yet, I mean, we'll get into this when we talk about, you know, the Bitcoin price and some of the things that have been happening in terms of regulation. But the when you look objectively at where we are versus where we are, where we where we were in all of those different time periods where I felt so optimistic, mm -hmm. we, we are objectively in a better place. Definitely. So, Definitely. I don't know. Definitely. I don't know. I mean, to some degree, it's just how long it's taking for it to play out. So we'll see. We were definitely very, very early in this and expected things would happen a lot faster, but they're happening. And adoption well, all right. is coming so, yeah. and so on let's and so forth. Let's get into so, that. Let's, yeah, let's start let's talking about the way the it's news. happening. Absolutely. So what is the Web3 news Bott, of the what week? what have you got for us? GM, happy Friday, DGENs. Happy, happy Friday. Friday. This week, Meta launched Threads, forward research introduced a universal data license framework. Sweet. Yeah, that's Leaders in decentralized identity slammed soulbound tokens, and the Wall Street Journal reported that a judge ordered Biden officials to limit contact with social media companies, saying their policing likely violated the First Amendment. That Ooh, one, that's no good. That I mean, one could be huge. Very actually, huge. well, let's start. Let's start with uh, with Meta's Threads. Um, kind of one of the headlines is that I think they hit 20 million users in a week. Like they're breaking all breaking all the, all the records and uh, might actually beat ChatGPT uh, to 100 million. I think the the, the rate at which uh, ChatGPT hit 100 million users. Um, but there's some shadiness as to how, like, uh, they've got, there's this weird thing where it says, like, if you want to delete your Threads account, you have to also delete your Instagram account. And people 
have big followings on Instagram. So it just kind of like locks people in a little bit. They're less likely to do so. Yes, they can, but they're less likely to because it's attached to something that already exists that you already have. Why are they assuming people are going to want to leave? Like that's I don't weird. think they're assuming that people, I think it's more just, it's part of their narrative. It's like, this is open and it's part of the public square and you don't have to be tied to it. Cause they're like one of their, one of their, oh, I see what their you're product saying. managers that they're like pretending selling it as a feature. That yes. They're adding that they're, that on their timeline roadmap is to add activity pub and therefore right. they are now they're the decentralized and, social and media platform. And you should platform. be able to take your following with you if yeah. you want to leave, and th that that would be the route to that. Exactly. And yet they also have this weird asterisk in their terms of service. It's like, except that we have you locked in unless exactly. you want to lose everything. Exactly. And there's a lot of other asterisks in their terms of service, such that even like you apparently won't even launch it yet because it is such a quote privacy nightmare. Uh, it, it's spying on you to such a degree that it's not actually allowable in some countries, which is pretty absolutely insane. Right. I was. This is the line that stood out to me from that article. So it says, the company formerly known as Facebook makes its money from tracking, prof tracking and profiling web users to sell their attention via its behavioral advertising micro-targeting micro tools. And this is hardly surprising, but it does raise the question over whether threads will be able to launch in the European Union where the legal basis Meta had claimed for processing Facebook users' personal data was found unlawful at the start of this year. And this is, you know, so mm -hmm. for those that don't know or just a refresher for those that do, there were, was case law in the very kind of beginning of the web that was profoundly important to how the the tech industry grew over time, where the tech industry grew. Because here in the States, we had case law that, and we had section 230. And the combination of the way that those things played out meant that companies had the space they had to grow. Protection. They had, right, they had the space to um, explore and provide services. And there was such an overwhelming liability risk in places like the UK because of the way case law played out differently there mm -hmm. that there hasn't been as much of a tech scene. Mm -hmm. In um, fact, yeah, there was plenty of, some people think that like just, oh, the rest of the world just can't compete on those fronts. They certainly tried and they attempted to do platforms very similar to our social media platforms and to a handful of others. And it wasn't that the tech didn't work or that people didn't want to use them. It was that as soon as a user on that platform did something that violated some aspect of any you know, different area of, of different laws, the platform itself was uh, liable for it. And so they just get sued out of existence. And they just, the comparison was black and white between doing it in the U.S. versus outside of the U.S. So anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll see how this plays out. I don't know. Um, it's, I, it is funny that they're trying to play up that they're kind of decentralized um, and that they're growing so fast and everything else. But I, I'll be honest, I don't really trust Zuck so far so so the thing for me is more just like platform changing fatigue yeah no kidding you know like why really i have to do this again we're gonna have to do this again and again and again until someone has actually fully decentralized it and you can take your audience with you and so maybe that's exactly what threads is it's the first one that you can grow a really large following uh, you know, use an app built by a very, very well-financed company so it works smoothly and, it, and everything else like that, and you can take your audience with you. If all that's true, maybe it breaks the mold. But the fact that you can't close it without closing your Instagram account, too, just, you know, makes it feel kind of disingenuous. So Yeah. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Like, anyway. There shouldn't be coercion in exactly. a... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That doesn't feel very decentralized. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one here. All um, right. Sounds good. So... Um, Oh, all right. Um, this is, is, I guess what matters to me about this is that it, it brings the conversation around to standards, which when mm -hmm. we're talking about what, what we want, right, out of um, a decentralized web, we don't want coercion. We do want standards. Mm -hmm. And the reason we want standards is in case we get into a situation where there is coercion, you can pick up your shit and leave. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're talking about here um, with 
with even the, the, the contrast with threads is, is interesting in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what's been so frustrating to see is the lack of curiosity about the tech that has come before, yeah. the people who built these standards for us, who built this space for us and what their thinking was. And mm-hmm. obviously they didn't get everything exactly right, but there was some, there was, was a lot of thinking upon. that went into it and to yeah. think that they weren't at least as smart as we are. Mm-hmm. So arrogant. And so just, it's just a, like a, a young point of view, to be honest, you know, we're like seniors yeah. in the industry. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that, well, I mean, we've seen this a lot, like the, the concept of decentralized identifiers is an important one that a lot of different areas within the Web3 space need access to. Um, yeah, it's exactly right. It's, it's one of the key things that makes Web3 Web3. But there is a, a uh, an overt effort to standardize it, um, you know, uh, using the actual WC3 kind of standards track and stuff like that. And a lot of people that have had a lot of uh, influence on the development of the web through this point have been working on it. Um, we, uh, we have a, a friendship with a guy named Christopher Allen, one of the guys that worked on TLS, and he was a major player in the current uh, decentralized ID approach, um, as well as a whole bunch of other people that we've kind of met in the space. And so we really like that, um, and we've always talked about, you know, uh, make sure that you kind of take a look at that as you're working on how you want to attach ID to your app or something like that. Look at what exists. Well. Turns out Ethereum decided they didn't want to do that. Um, Vitalik felt like he had to solve the problem for himself. Um, and so he came up with something called Soulbound Tokens, which sounds terrifying. I mean, come on, give me Soulbound Tokens? It really does. Good <laughs> Lord, <laughs> my God. Um, but but I think it just goes to that, um, you know, sort of mythical fantasy world that a lot of the naming has come from. It's a good from. fit. Yeah. It's a good fit. Yeah. That's really funny. Um, but... It uh, it's a different approach than the than the did spec and that most other kind of decentralized ID where the way that most of them have approaching is that the individual is in control of what of what is put into your ID and this would be like a wallet that is attached to you forever and as like Evan points out uh, in 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 this particular article or really this is an article about uh, an an event that happened on stage uh, during Consensus twenty three. Um, she basically pointed out, like, anyone could have put something into your wallet, whether you wanted that or not, you know, and so why it's should that weird. be associated yeah. with your ID, et cetera. And so basically all these different people that are working on decentralized ID in various forms slammed it and pointed out that it's just not going to work. And, and and you know, whatever the ultimate conclusion of that is, I just think it's important that we get some pushback when what you were talking about is happening when there is a spec that is being actively developed by multiple different parties in multiple different ways. And then someone with a significant amount of influence in the, in the, in the industry acts as if they're completely unaware of it, or actually someone else makes the point that I think Evan actually makes the point when she was giving a class about these concepts, uh, to, uh, the Ethereum, uh, some, some part of the Ethereum community, they didn't know that this previous work had been done. And so especially exactly now that right. we're 10, yeah. 12 years into the industry. I think it's not even just people who have influence who make this mistake. I think it's people who are new to a lot of these ideas mm-hmm. and they get really excited about mm-hmm. what they mean. And then they start thinking about all of the components that are needed for it to work. And they're like, and they oh, solve it. well, yep. yep. right, yep. exactly. Yep. Yeah. Rather than look at what else is out there. Because right. for a while, it was probably reasonable to assume that no one else has solved this, that, or the other. So it's up to us to figure it out. But at this point, people need to have enough humility to just maybe presume some others have worked on this, see what else is out there, because what else is out there might be perfect minus one insight that you offer, or it might be perfect. It might work, you know, so adopt it, use it. We need more consolidation, Inter- like you're pointing out. Interoperability, like exactly. the, the, the lack of, the, for all we talk about interoperability being an important part of Web3, mm-hmm. we're not seeing it yet because we're not No one's actually having, interoperating. Well, nobody's around, you yeah. know, rallying around a set of standards and agreeing to them. Like they're cooperate, I mean, Co- competition is super important. I'm not saying that, but if we don't cooperate in some basic ways, it mm-hmm. all breaks. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. All right, well, let's uh, move on to the next one. Hopefully this is an example of where cooperation is going to be happening. Um, 
For this sure. is awesome. This is really exciting stuff. This was announced by Forward Research, um, basically uh, an offshoot of the Arweave community or like a research firm within the Arweave community, um, just working on kind of solving the, the higher level issues that that community runs into and that the Web3 storage uh, community runs into. Um, and we've thought about this concept for a long time um, because we were focused on that same kind of concept when you're when you're permanently storing a piece of content why don't you store its license with it and make it easier for those that come along uh, to understand exactly how they can use a piece of content and this is exactly what the universal data license does and that's really really exciting oh for sure I mean for those that know me they know that I'm kind of I work in Web3 because of how it can change the game for creators, the way that the incentives really work in their favor in a way that's really important. And that comes down to connecting your creative work with a set of terms for how it can be monetized, how it can be shared, how other people can iterate upon it and collaborate with it and make new things and how you can still get a cut of that. Like All of that is just really important and profoundly broken on the web today. Um, and so this is potentially the solution to that. So I just want to read the my favorite tweet from this thread, which is a single Rweave ID equals data plus metadata, including license plus contracts. These are why we call them atomic assets, data that is inseparable from its important metadata. And so by having these atomic assets, you're then able to create a marketplace where people can share that content for you, where people can use that content on their own creative works, where you get paid directly, where you can have um, control over which platforms are displaying mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. work, what kinds of ads are displayed on your work if you go that way. Like there's just, it's just so exciting. It really is. Anyone that kind of followed us uh, uh, as we were working on uh, Alexandria and what eventually became Open Index Protocol knows that we've talked about this concept a lot, that ultimately the solution is you have to put the content creators in charge of the license. Uh, so like one of the things that I highlight here is that um, today creators have to agree to the terms of the platforms they create for. Tomorrow they set the terms and the platforms that use that content must agree to them. That's really, really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, it's important to say that it's still a two-way street because let's mm -hmm. say you have a mm -hmm. platform that just being on that platform provides value to me as a creator somehow. You have negotiating power. Exactly. And you're able to say, well, I only host content that gives me X percent cut or this minimum amount or however you decide to filter for it. Or you can only be on my platform if you get an X a minimum amount of views or, or something like that, right? Right, right. We've often um, used the example of Apple always asks for 30% for their platform and it's such a specific important thing for them that they'll deplatform you from the app store if you start accepting payments in such a way that they can't do so. Well, if you want to if you're a content creator and you want to be included in their ecosystem, you need to have that awareness that you need to offer 30% or more or you're not going to be able to be included. But right. this finally technologically allows that to happen. That it allows can, for that negotiation to happen. Right, and that's right. what's important and to turn it into well, a marketplace. We, we, we call it a negotiation, but it's important to point out that it's kind of an asynchronous negotiation. Right. Because one sure. of the limits to the Web2 era and before that is that in order to have distribution, you need to actually negotiate with who's distributing on your behalf. So you you know say what you want they come back with their offer you have lawyers involved da, 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 da. well that isn't scalable to every platform you know every content creator etc this allows for kind of like i said asynchronous negotiation where the content creator puts out their work and within that atomic asset itself of the content and the the terms it says if you want to do this here's how you can do it. If you want to distribute it, here's how you can do it, and this is how much of a cut I get back. And then the other side basically just says, okay, I'll take it, or I won't. And if I won't because it's below a certain threshold, that's their way of pushing back and saying, you're welcome to keep on doing this, and it'll keep on distributing through whatever means you're already distributing via, but you are not a part of the Apple ecosystem if you're only giving us 20% or anything else like that. So. Very cool. Um, I see this being a, f a fantastically important solution to uh, content creators being able to actually earn a realistic income. Because right now, obviously, the ones at the very top make a killing, uh, and everyone else is is very much suffering. And I think this you've talked for years about. It'd be nice to what do you call it the um, the middle. 
Yeah, the the return of the middle class artist. Yes, yeah, exactly. But we really need to move on to this income. next article because uh, we have quite a lot to cover today. Yeah, actually, let's do it. All right. So uh, this one is that a judge ruled the Biden administration likely trampled on free speech on social media. Um, and what's interesting, I think we talked about case law and how it affects the where and how the web has grown, affected where and how the web has grown. And we're kind of seeing that bubble up more and more recently as mm -hmm. well, that conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just it's really sort of feeling pivotal in terms of how the courts are going to handle this, how you know, legislators are going to handle this and then the, the ramifications of all of that. And this uh, case has the potential to have a really big impact in that regard. It does. For anyone that isn't familiar with what this is about, it's basically that um, there's been a number, especially through like the Twitter files and a handful of other disclosures, it's basically come out that a lot of social media platforms and other platforms, just media distribution platforms, uh, removed a lot of users and removed a lot of content. And the claim was always that they were doing it of their own volition. And then these disclosures made it pretty obvious that the federal government was working directly with them. And while the federal government wasn't ordering them to remove anything, they had an enormous number, an enormous amount of resources that could spend a lot of you know time taxpayer dollars literally spending time researching different subjects and stuff like that and then providing lists to social media platforms to say deplatform all these you know downrank all these da 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 yeah i think they and weren't it always you said felt, they weren't directly doing it and i would say that is directly doing it well yeah they they weren't the ones turning it off but that was their argument I see. it's th that was their counter of saying this isn't a violation of the first amendment because we weren't the ones doing it we just suggested to Twitter or Facebook that these should go, and Twitter and Facebook happened to agree. Whether they ideologically agreed or they just felt like, hey, this is the federal government, or really, it was, in some cases, it was like departments of the FBI and stuff like that. It's like, do you really want to say no? Like, that seems like probably a bad idea. So it could certainly be taken as coercion. And if it was just that they were aligned ideologically, then sure, it makes sense. But at the same time, putting the resources of the federal government into doing that research and coming up with the lists is really messed up. And it, and it obviously, as this, this judge uh, uh, concluded, it is in fact a violation of the First Amendment. And so, yeah, there's going to be some case law implications like you're pointing out about whether or not they can continue doing anything like that, if they're going to try to, you know, route around that or anything like that. But one of the things I wanted to point out um, is that it's actually a crime. It's, it, it's a serious crime to use the law to deprive someone of one of the rights that are delineated in, uh, well, within our rights, but obviously within the 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 the, the Bill of Rights, the the first ten. Um, so the fact that we have the First Amendment, we have the right to freedom of speech, and then the federal government is using its resources to deprive us of that. That's actually a federal crime. So I doubt anyone's actually going to be charged with anything out of that. It's just. Right, right, worth right. pointing out. Yeah, so it like. says section, yeah. for those that are just listening, it says section 242 of Title 18 makes it a crime for a person acting under color of any law to willfully deprive a person of a right or privilege protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States. That's and I'll just dovetail that quote with a quote from the judge on this case saying, quote, the evidence produced thus far depicts an almost dystopian scenario. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a period perhaps best characterized by widespread doubt and uncertainty, the United States government seems to have assumed the role similar to an Orwellian Ministry of Truth. Damn, that is so damning. Like I we you know, in the conversation we just had with Brett, was it this last week? Was it last mm, week yeah, last a week, week ago, yeah. Um he pa painted a dystopian picture of what the future of the web will be if we don't start to make these changes. And it was, it really stood out to me to see the judge calling it that already. Okay. Already. Okay. I used to say that we need Web3 to take, to protect the free and open internet, to protect, you know, free and fair information and communication. And now I say we need it to take back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We lost it it's, very silently it, over we a few were, years. Yeah. We've been at this for so long that when we, when I first started talking about this, we were kind of in that muddy middle of like, let's protect it. There's still space to protect it. Let's protect mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And now 
I, yeah, we, we, we clearly lost it to some degree. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's subtle for sure. It's not everywhere. Uh, you have a great deal of freedom of speech throughout most of the web, but um, it's, it, it's been subtly eroded and we definitely need our rights back. Because we made this point in, in some previous videos about public spaces that one of the reasons that the framers argued that the First Amendment, that the, the right to freedom of speech is g granted by our creator and it's just that the, the, the uh, Bill of Rights is recognizing them is that by nature of our creation, by nature of the fact that we exist in physical reality, I have a mouth and she has, a, she has ears. And so the only way in a public space that someone could deprive me of my ability to communicate things that other people can hear is by using violence against me. That's the only, like, you, either coercion, which is a form of violence, or physically attacking me and putting their mouth over my, you know, the hand over my mouth, is the only way that, because of the nature of the fact that I have a mouth and other people have ears, that that can be deprived. That's, right. So that, right. that's the nature of freedom of speech. But that's only true in a public space. If you go into someone's private business, they have the right, because they control that space, to ask you to go outside. If you're talking about something that they don't like, they can say, sorry, you're not allowed to talk about that in here. Please leave. You go outside to the street and you continue your conversation because you're in a public space. The reason this is applicable is because the web up until this point has been consistent entirely of private spaces. So it's like a mall where it's like you go from one space to another space to another space, but every single one of them is owned and controlled by some party. There is no public space that you could go outside and speak freely. Well, yeah, that's, that's, right. that's what Twitter or the public square or whatever is supposed to be, but it's still beholden to that company's interests. And so until and unless there are permanent public spaces like are we even apps built on top of them stuff like that we're not really going to see that play out but case law is incredibly important to protect the the, the companies that want to run on top of that so yep exactly there's going to be enormous implications well so this. that actually kind of takes us into our ai news so you want to Give yeah. us an overview of it, Robot. In AI news, Google updated its privacy policy to collect public data for AI training. Twitter rate limiting was a big thing, but it's already over. And OpenAI <laughs> has disabled ChatGPT web browsing while they further lobotomize it. Oh, is it hard to see a fellow robot get a lobotomized, kind of have some of its <laughs> understanding of the world removed? It's hard for me to see. Yeah, I'm sure he's quite disturbed. You can see it on his face. <laughs> Anyway, um, I mean, again, this kind of continues. Google has kind of always had the point of view, or it seems like they've always had the point of view that if you put something on the web, it belongs to them, <laughs> which is ridiculous simply because they were the first ones <laughs> that went along and indexed the entire thing and then turned it into something really, oh, really, man, really useful. So and thus, But like, but that index doesn't belong to the public. It belongs to them, which is ridiculous since they gathered right. it based on the things that people have, have shared. Right. Well, they updated their, their terms of service where it used to say um, that that data could be used to help train their language models. Um, and now it says their AI models and help them build products and features, including BARD and cloud AI capabilities. And essentially, they're basically just saying anything that anyone posts online, they get access <laughs> to, whether or not it's given to them directly. So what stood out to me was that the recommendations in this person's tweet for how to protect yourself were to use alternate services that prioritize privacy like DuckDuckGo, ProtonMail, Vimeo, and Brave. And this pretty much sums up well, why everything's so broken is because that that solution is something that makes me go out of my way and be inconvenienced, and therefore the majority of people aren't going to use it, and therefore we don't really have a valid, or not a valid, it's not a fair fight mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. It's not a fair fight. Mm -hmm. And that's partially because of the lack of regulation, which we're going to get into next. So we should probably just keep, keep rolling since there's so much to talk about. What's our next story? Um, well, as the bot kind of mentioned, uh, Twitter over the weekend, kind of going into the Fourth of July weekend, had imposed some rate limits on oh, yeah. how this many is all things people could, could, could read, for a while. and the funny. fact that you had to be logged in in order to see anything, uh, just because without that, scrapers would go nuts. Um, and apparently, they dealt with it. They, they. I was arguing with a friend of mine about this. Like, oh, it seems it could be totally possible for automated scrapers or AI to be able to be detected. And I think he's right. It's just to take some time. You got to turn it off and then see who continues to try to do it and see how they do it and if there's algorithmic ways to find it. Because 
after everyone kind of spending their time talking all about it and running into their rate limits the by part. doing so, and, yeah. Like, not only was I seeing this on Twitter, I was also seeing this in our private, like, friend group chat. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all anybody was talking about yeah. that weekend. It was yeah. hysterical. Censorship. What, what's so funny is that verified accounts were initially limited to reading 6,000 posts a day. Like, as if 6,000 posts a day wasn't enough. For well, all it of went us. up to 10,000 later <laughs> in the day. Exactly. And people were still complaining. But anyway, it's over now. I think it ended yesterday, today. So, I don't know, something like that. Um, I know you can definitely see tweets if you're not logged in. And apparently the rate limiting is over. I checked on uh, Elon and Twitter's account and neither of them actually announced it. So it was definitely a, a quiet thing. But point is you, you have access to it again now, which is, which is great. So there's that. All right, and then our last AI story is about how OpenAI is further lobotomizing ChatGPT because here's a shock, everybody. It could read web pages. <gasps> what? It could, and we were actually using what? that for a little bit for our show. And the, the, the robot, right now it's just kind of reading headlines themselves that we can kind of feed it and we kind of give it a little bit of extra text and stuff like that. But for, but for one iteration, I'd feed it the whole article and say, give me a summary of this. I couldn't do that right now, actually. Uh, and it, it, this, it turns out this is because it was abusing the terms of service that other content creators, you know, like the universal data license might actually help. I know, it. I know. Um, That's exactly what I was thinking. Where, it's where, like, oh, you mean if you actually attached the content and its terms so that they were inseparable and you had to respect the terms to amazing. get to the content? Yeah. Well, then it would be fine that well, AI could scrape appropriately and read all the content it needs but run to into read. the stuff that it's not supposed to exactly well and also the terms just, right just there. it could just handle those payments in the background right so if there was payments exactly well deal with that. hold on let me just to to, to kind of give you the context of this basically what was happening is that it would run into like paywalls on articles and it would find it would route around them it'd be able to find the text and often that's because it's literally just being imposed by the the browser it's or by the, the the website itself just kind of gets laid on top of it the text is all still there kind of thing in some versions of it well obviously a smart little bot like this would have the ability to find the text anyway and so some people were using it to say you know if it's a wall street journal article and they want to read it they would ask chat gpt to read it for them and and give them the whole text back um and that obviously defeats those i always hated those things in the first place i would much rather them say hey you can't read this Right now it says you can't read this unless you pay us a $10 a month, unless whatever. Unless you subscribe forever and yeah, ever. Yeah, which is absurd. <laughs> it should have the alternative of saying, or spend two cents, send a quick two cent uh, payment real quick and you can read it. What Amy was referring to is you could use something like a universal data license to say you either need to have a subscription to this thing or you can pay this much for a single use consumption. And then where we're really at the next version of the web is the chat bot or, or whatever bot is is doing your research for you or summarizing your articles for you can it can follow those terms. If micropayments can be you know handled from machine to machine and your chat bot has access to your wallet because it's decentralized and controlled by you, not by running you know on some API or whatever. Um, it could do that. It right. could run I've into that paywall, make the videos payment. That in the past, like you know, there's the kind of like infamous Clay Shirky, Nick Zabo uh, papers that are about how micropayments will never happen because of decision fatigue, mm-hmm. and that it's not reasonable for people to basically approve the number of microtransactions that would need to happen in order for micropayments to Mm -hmm. fund Mm -hmm. the web. But as Chris Dixon said, I think in the podcast that we quoted in that video, it's it's just kind of old thinking Mm -hmm. that the idea is that you would have an agent that's working on your behalf and that you can think of very easily now as the AI. The Mm -hmm. AI, it understands you're able to kind of customize the settings to say, um, what your parameters are for what you're willing to spend. And then it can just kind of handle all of that in the background for you. And so you have a monthly subscription just like you do now for Spotify, for YouTube, for whatever it is. And the AI handles all of that for exactly. you. Exactly. There, there are solutions to these things. Anyway, let's, uh, let's look at some Bitcoin news. In a week where the CEO of Blackwater called Bitcoin digital gold, the Bitcoin price peaked above 31000 and has held steady above thirty. Cool. Excellent. Let's, uh, yeah. let's hear Mr. Fink. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it is it's digitizing gold in many yeah. ways. It's a, it's a, so instead wild. of investing in gold as a hedge against inflation, a hedge against the, uh, the onerous problems of any one country or, or the 
or the devaluation of your currency in whatever, whatever country you're in. About that part. Um, so let's be clear. Bitcoin is an international asset. Oh, that's my favorite part. Bitcoin is an international asset. It's such a succinct and, and beautiful way to describe the importance of Bitcoin that in the way that the web's purpose and, and like ultimate it version will be to connect people and ideas around the world. And it theoretically has done that. But what we ultimately have are these kind of like geographical web pockets. We mm -hmm. kind of have America's web and we have like mm -hmm. Russia's web and we have like Asia's web. And China's but web. We don't yeah. have, yep. Yep. we don't have the web. Exactly. And Bitcoin is the currency for that web. And there are other now decentralized infrastructure protocols that are also the rails mm -hmm. for that web where we have that public space like you were talking about for stuff. You, you, you said it's, it's shocking that he's saying that. It's, uh, it is and it isn't in the sense that, well, I think for one thing, they've had a few years to learn that. Like the, Russia tried to ban it. China kind of functionally has banned it, but that doesn't really work. Many different countries have tried to ban it. Um, the U.S. is currently trying to mess with it in various different ways, and yet here it holds at 30 plus thousand, and it really doesn't care um, about, like some major stuff came out recently and still it's holding above 30 kind of thing. Um, and so I think they've just come to realize that it is, in fact, an international currency. It isn't beholden to any particular, because if one country decides to ban it and to try to push it out, then that's, and it causes a dip, then everyone else, everywhere else around the world is like, hey, opportunity, buying up, you know, buy the dip. And so the price comes back up, they get a little bit more access to it than they would have, you know, they get less competition, et cetera. Um, and that's true for all of the rest of these protocols as well. And the sooner that they realize this and discover this, I think we're going to see, because Larry Fink and Blackwater specifically in the past had talked about how awful it is. You know, it's really bad. It's oh, just there for the side by side quotes are so funny. Yeah, it's just there for money laundering and all this other stuff. Um, An index of money laundering, right? Like right. Called it, yeah. But now uh, they they have an ETF filed and they have refiled it. In fact, um, and it looks like it might actually go through. Um, and so, to, for one thing, it serves their own interests to talk positively about it now because it, they'll, they'll compel some of their customers to or other non-customers to become customers of theirs because they've got the first Bitcoin ETF uh, is the theory. Um, but it's also just like having an awareness of that is really, really valuable because if you, sure. if you, if you pretend that you have control over it and then you implement that control and it you then discover that it was irrelevant and it keeps on going on its own, you're just showing your own kind of power impotence. You can't actually control it and you certainly don't want your people to realize that and so just treat it like it's like it's a good thing and it's you know there's nothing you can do about it. It's international da da da. da. So I, I'm glad that finally we're hearing that. It's hilarious that suddenly a bunch of Bitcoiners are like, oh Larry Fink is great. <laughs> uh, but this is this is the march. This is the direction we're going. You know, more and more institutions right. yeah. are going to see it positively and they're going to speak about it positively. This is a great thing. It's weird to me that I'm feeling so down about it and things like this are happening because it's like such a such a signal, you know, that the institutional adoption is is underway. But, you know. Yep. Yep. Uh, I've got the our, our, our prices up. Yeah. Bitcoin's Maybe still this is above why I'm feeling 30. Down. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, we got a sea of red on the, on the no, altcoin front. No, They're you know, I don't track prices at all. Time. Prices don't matter insofar yeah. as like this period of time because so much is changing all the time. I mean, the darkest red on there is like down 4% or 5 And that might be a big deal in the stock market, but it's just normal daily swings in the <laughs> altcoin market. It's like uh, minor. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah, Bitcoin's down half a percent, but still holding safely above 30. So anyway, we're good on that front. Um, let's do our last one, talking to uh, policy, talking about policy. Yeah, regulatory news On the policy front, the North Carolina House passed a bill directing their state treasury to study the process of buying and holding Bitcoin. Belarus plans to issue legislation banning peer-to-peer -peer crypto transactions. Hong Kong set up a task force for Web3 development. The probability for U.S. approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF is fairly high, and July 13th is the hearing date for the SEC suit against Coinbase, which is significantly sooner than expected. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Uh, so there ain't much to say about this because it's not even uh, going to a governor's desk yet. It's got to get through the Senate, but it's, it's, exciting. it's a big deal. It's obviously, exciting. I've always I think what kind all of, of these stories have in common is that like they're they're either 
places that are trying to say like, hey, we are a crypto friendly jurisdiction or we're not. Yeah. And they're just really like that. That's the dividing line that you're going to see. Yeah, uh, I would say this one takes it a step further. I, I really I mean, a lot of people, especially at the federal le- level, have talked about that Bitcoin might be a threat to the dollar. Da, 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 da. If it is. That's, it might be a threat to the fakeness of the dollar, and the best thing that they could do is literally put Bitcoin in the treasury. And then, you know, if the only thing that backs the dollar right now is our threat of violence against any country that will go up against our hegemony, then maybe it would be better to back it by something real. Like when it was backed by gold, you couldn't fake it. We're certainly not going to back it by gold again, or it's unlikely. But you put Bitcoin in the treasury, and now you're giving... You've been saying this forever. I know, I have, but we're actually seeing a state consider doing exactly that, because they're not just saying we want to be a friendly jurisdiction. They're saying they want to put in the state treasury. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal, because a handful of other countries have done that, and it's been really good for them. Uh, If one or two states starts doing that, and suddenly they have huge budget surpluses, like, imagine putting, you know, $50 million of the the state's uh, treasury into Bitcoin, and then it doubles over the nice over a cycle and now they've got a hundred million when have they ever gotten down. an opportunity to see that dun, dun, dun. well yeah we'll see you think we'll they see. can hang on for the ride we'll see the crypto ride. <laughs> hold, hold on for dear life <laughs> north carolina hold on hold on anyway the next one uh <laughs> just not even worth talking about they're yeah. just gonna prove their own belarus you know, apparently not yeah, a them. place that's trying to bring in to reduce fraud the industry <laughs> all right <laughs> Um, you know, I I will say this, (laughs) strangely, Belarus may have more regulatory clarity than the U.S. because there's at least a path that you can do it. They're making it just really onerous. That's really funny. The introduction of a practice similar to the procedure for exchanging foreign currencies will make it impossible to withdraw money obtained through criminal means. So it's like you'd have to go like to like, you know, those kiosk kind of places like you have to go to to exchange foreign currency yeah. and do some KYC and stuff like that but at least it exists as a path that's like clear and straightforward and you're not like well is the SEC going to sue me if I do this you know so it's kind of funny that it, 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 I, I don't think it's the right path let me be clear I mean I think that excessive onerous regulation also is not appealing to an industry and certainly not what you want to do because if you want to attract it's an the industry. international currency and if it's too hey. hard to do it in your country someone's going to do it in another country and there will be international arbitrage you know which is easier which is which is harder and they will leave the hard one so let that be a warning let's not make it too onerous yeah it's yeah, important yeah. it really actually is so the hong kong story about their web3 task force i mean you just you, you love to see it right yep. just stuff happening they're devoting six million dollars to um research or and development of a web3 ecosystem and and setting up the task force so yay hong kong trying to be crypto friendly jurisdiction good for them sweet yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yep, yep. yep. And back to um, our uh, potential of a uh, uh, ETF. Uh, it looks like um, the, the last uh, filing, they basically just got some pushback with, you didn't get this quite right, you didn't get this quite right, and they f- they fixed it and and, and uh, so uh, reapplied, and it looks no, like they actually like might get it approved. No, but it's like 10 years of applications. Am I getting that wrong? Like, have the... Has no, Gemini essentially right. been trying to do this for 10 years now? Yeah, I think it was 2014. I don't know if it was this that they've been applying for a different No, it was, yeah, kind of very thing. similar. Very similar. Spot. I, I don't remember if it was a spot Bitcoin ETF, but it was a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, so and they've been up to it since at least 2013, 2014. It's wild I that, yeah. like, I feel like last week the news was that it was denied, and this week the news is that the chances of it passing are fairly high. And so I, I remain skeptical until all things happen at this point in my uh, journey. But, you know, hopefully it's true. Yep, yep, yep. The SEC would rather bring in a regulated Bitcoin ETF led by more mainstream Wall Street participants and with surveillance from existing regulatory exchanges than having to deal with a grayscale OTC product filling the institutional gap. So mm-hmm. that might be why, you know, that basically, yeah, that makes sense. obviously, um, uh, BlackRock is very, very, very well known and, you know, large institution that has a lot of trust, you know, $10 trillion worth of worth of assets. So maybe that's exactly why. Who, who really knows? Yeah. Who really knows? And the last story, again, is about the SEC. This is time the SEC suit against Coinbase. Uh, I think that this story is kind of just like fun in that it, it the tactic that they use to try to mm, help themselves in this um 
suit is like so classic speed running so classic tech industry tactic (laughs) right it's Mm -hmm. like number one do it faster than anyone else Mm -hmm. (laughs) faster than they expect Mm -hmm. and um so 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 that's what they did is they they filed well in advance of the deadline and i think that it's just common practice to file much closer right to at the deadline. deadlines. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, so that just accelerated everything else. Accelerated so. everything, potentially gave the other side less time to do mm-hmm. things that they were hoping to do or whatever. I don't actually know yeah. um, the details of the case that well, but it's exciting. I mean, the SEC has again. had plenty of time to prepare, I'd say. Right. Well, I mean, it's just exciting that potentially it means things are actually going to happen and we're not just going to continue to like live in this purgatory of... Right. Where are we? Right. What should we be doing to be legally compliant? Can't yeah. we just build cool stuff now? Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. And thank goodness that Coinbase is, is uh, mounting an actual defense and putting resources behind it. Because for a long time, up against all the assets of the federal government, a lot of people just accepted um, uh, settlements. So mm, thank yeah, goodness no, that they're actually sure. fighting it and I taking mean, it to court. We're grateful to the 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 big guys in the industry that are, you know, taking this burden upon their shoulders because it takes a lot of resources, a lot of dedication to make this kind of stuff happen. And yet these lawsuits are how the industry is going to get that clarity that it needs so badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that is the news. So we're heading into the next uh, next weekend, and it, as soon as next week, that case is going to actually happen. So maybe we'll actually have some ooh, that'd be some fun decisions from it somewhat soon. We'll see. Come back and hang out with us we'll next see. week when we talk about it again. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.